Welcome to the 13th reading of my memoir, The Innocence of Guilt. Christmas, the happiest time of the year. Despite the small size of my family and the yearning for relatives who never materialized, other than the witches I was more than thankful to be rid of, all those reveries evaporated at Christmas my favorite time of the year. At school, I made paper chains out of strips of brightly colored paper glued together with a flower and water paste. The teachers strung them up all over the classroom walls and a few came home to decorate our house. My parents festooned the front and back rooms with twisted crepe paper hung from the four corners. In the middle of the ceilings dangled a paper bell. No Christmas tree. Holly with its bright red berries hung over each fireplace and a sprig of mistletoe nailed above the front door. Dindin loved to catch us under the sprig and give us a kiss. A berry for a kiss. And when all the berries were plucked, the kissing ended. What I relished most were the weeks leading up to the magic day itself as my mother prepared all the special baking. Gleefully anticipated Christmas pudding with nutmeg sauce, mince pies, sausage rolls, and Christmas fruit cake. Can we help mummy? David and I begged, each making a secret wish as she allowed us a stir of the ingredients of the pudding in a large yellow china mixing bowl on the dinner table. We nibbled at raisins, candied fruit, and finished off the stout from the dregs at the bottom of the bottle. We both loved the taste. The cloth-wrapped pudding went into a pot to steam, but not before a sixpenny piece wrapped in wax paper was inserted into the middle. Whoever found it in their piece of pudding on Christmas Day would have good luck all year long. The Christmas fruitcake was by far the most exciting event to witness taking shape. David and I helped mix the ingredients, quite similar to the pudding. The difference came in the decorating of the cooked and cooled cake. Marzipan went on first, allowed to cool overnight, then a layer of royal icing before the next step, the one we both excitedly anticipated. Out of a box came the cake decorations. The same ones each year. Familiar and comforting. As each little piece came out, we marvelled at seeing it again. On the round white iced cake, our mother carefully placed a miniature house, three green fir trees, a mirrored glass pond with three little ducks sitting on it, and Father Christmas with a sack full of toys making his way over to the house. As I gazed in wonder on that little scene, created all over again after such a long year's absence, my heart was full of the magic to come. My mother stored the baked goods in tins with tight-fitting lids and placed them on shelves in the front room cupboard. She gave David and me strict instructions not to touch anything, but I could not resist sneaking into the cupboard, prizing up the lids and sniffing the contents. Groups of carolers from different churches walked from house to house in the cold winter evenings. Sometimes people opened their doors to allow the carolers a little warmth from inside. Others went so far as to offer them hot beverages when they reached the corner of our street, I watched and listened from the high vantage point of our six steps leading up to the front door. On Christmas Eve, David and I hung an empty pillowcase for our toys at the end of our beds. The wide chimney in the bedroom amply served for Father Christmas to clamber down. Before we went to bed, we left a biscuit and a beaker of milk for him beside the hearth as a reward for his generosity towards us. In the middle of the night, I awoke. 
reached down to the end of the bed and felt around the outside of the pillowcase, bulging with unwrapped toys, wrapping paper being too expensive the first few years after the war. Not wanting to spoil the surprises, I crept back and snuggled down under the covers to wait for the morning light to flood the room. At first light, I spotted a golden-coloured teddy bear poking out of the top of the pillowcase. Beside my bed stood a blue toy pushchair. I sat the teddy bear in the pushchair, grabbed the pillowcase, climbed into my parents' bed and pulled the rest of the presents out to show them. My father took charge of the Christmas chicken. He'd fattened it up all year by feeding it extra nutritious food. In the shed, the day before, he'd wrung its neck and plucked it, and on him fell the job of cleaning its stinky insides out. With much flair, he chopped up onions on a large wooden board and mixed in eggs and seasonings for the pork stuffing, tastier than the chicken itself. Crunchy roast potatoes, Brussels sprouts, and gravy prepared by mummy. Steam filled the scullery all morning whilst everything cooked. David and I played with our toys and grew hungrier by the minute as we anticipated the upcoming feast. On the dining table in the front room, warmed by a blazing coal fire, sat crackers filled with paper hats, little toys, and strips of paper with funny riddles printed on them. We each helped one another pull them apart to hear the bang, then wore the paper hats while we ate dinner and quizzed each other with the riddles. At 3 p.m., with the table cleared and all the washing up done, David and I stayed quiet while the grown-ups settled down to listen to the King's Christmas speech broadcast live over the wireless. My family wouldn't dream of missing it. After all the food we'd consumed at dinner, we still looked forward to mince pies, sausage rolls and the glorious Christmas cake at tea time. The cast iron nutcracker dog that lived for most of the year on top of the chest of drawers on the landing found its way down the stairs to help us tackle the bowl of walnuts, almonds, brazils, and small round cobnuts. In the evening, my father brought out his mouth organ and played lively songs. Dindin sang along and jiggled me up and down on his knee to the rhythm of the music. The next door neighbors came and Mr. Sadler played the spoons, tapping them together on his knee in a variety of rhythms a collection he'd bent himself to make different sounds. Christmas of 1950, a popular song on the wireless was All I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. I didn't want any new teeth. No, all I wanted was to see my family glittering with happiness, not only at Christmas time, but all year long. Thank you for listening. Please feel free to subscribe, like or comment on this reading and hopefully you will tune in to the next one. Bye for now.